Hey everyone, welcome to The Goods, a film podcast. I'm here with Brian. How are we doing today, Brian? Hey everybody, welcome back if you're joining us again, or for the first time if you're just getting on the train, because we are here once again in our theme month based around locomotives and the cars that they pull. Absolutely, yeah. But, despite it being train month, Brian, we you might as well call it boat month, because you and I, we had a special outing this about a week ago. You and me and my wife, we went to go see the 3D re-release of Titanic, the 1997 James Cameron film. That's right. So it's the 25th-ish anniversary of the film. I believe that was the justification. I think Cameron just wanted to be pulling in two income sources at once while Avatar 2 is still out. (laughs) Yeah. That's right. Yeah, the Avatar 2 and Titanic are neck and neck for number three and number four highest grossing movies of all time, I think it is, which is just pretty outrageous because he also has number one, which is the original Avatar. But uh, I figured we could just briefly recap our reactions to seeing the Titanic in theater. It was my first time seeing it in theater, and I know you had, and uh, we can check in on that. Um, We have talked about Titanic before. We talked about it uh, back um, when we talked about A Night to Remember, that was actually the episode title, but we, we talked quite a bit about Titanic as part of that. Right, and it comes up in conversation time and time again. It's a movie that we both like. When we went down to Orlando, we tried to go to a Titanic museum, but it was closed. It was after hours. <laughs> yeah, it was a slight bummer. Um, before we dive into that, I just wanted to note something I saw on the news earlier and shared with Brian and shared with our discord, Jansen Panettiere, who is near and dear to our hearts, uh, passed away over the, the weekend. And, um, you know, we, we've clowned a lot on Jansen, particularly for his acting performance in, uh, what's that movie called? Last Day of Summer. Yeah. And so, you know, obviously heartbroken to see his untimely passing. They didn't release a cause of death, but, you know, he was young and healthy and had publicly uh, dealt with mental health issues in the past. And so, you know, you, you start to wonder, whatever the case may be, if the fact that he was a someone whose acting career didn't take off and had a lot of stress in his life impacted part of that. Obviously, much of our clowning was on his, what we thought was a bad performance in the uh, the last day of summer. And uh, you never like never like to hear it, and you especially never like to hear it for someone who you have spent a lot of time clowning on. Um, so you know, obviously, lots of lots of love sent out to uh, Jansen's loved ones and people who are dealing with this. And just for me, a reminder that even when you clown on someone, especially if it's a kid actor, that there is a real person behind that dealing with the stress of Hollywood, which is not known for being a particularly comforting place to live and exist. Brian, you had sent me an article written by the star of Ned's Declassified recently, where he talked about being a, essentially a failed child actor. And like, when you think you've made it, you've got some roles and then all of a sudden it peters out and how it's hard to come to come to grips with that and hard to live a normal life after that. It's just kind of a, a bleak existence. And I imagine Jansen probably was facing a little bit of that too. Yeah. It can't be easy. And I mean, we don't have that big of a listenership, so I don't think any of it is really on us. But, you know, our two biggest targets of dunking on have been uh, Tommy from Power Rangers and Jansen Panettiere. And in the last four months, they've both died. Dark times. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mark Regan and Max Magician. It gets better. (laughs) Thomas Showerman, or what was that guy's name? The star of George of the Jungle. Christopher Showerman. Yeah. Chez Starbuck. Oh, man. You keep selling cabinets, man. Yeah, yeah. And just, you know, in honor of how near and dear Jansen was to our heart, even as a target of clowning, um, I'm going to make a small donation on behalf of the goods to Heart to Heart International, which supports refugees in Ukraine. And I caught up on his recent social media, and that was kind of one of his last big causes was refugees in Ukraine. So I figured that would be a way to honor him. So nice. I'll be doing that. But... On to something that 
uh, heartbreaking in a very different way in the way that you want to be heartbroken at the theaters, and that is Titanic. Heartbreak feels good in a place like this. <laughs> oh, sp- speaking of, this was the first time I saw the AMC intro, the the one that over on Buzzed on Movies, they've much, much lauded. Oh, yeah. We haven't talked too much about it, but it, so every AMC theater, at least everyone I've been to over the past couple of years, which is the main one I go to, um, the main tra- chain I go to, opens with, wh- what's the actress again? Nicole Kidman. Is it Nicole Kidman? That's right. Yeah, she uh, she d- gives this intro. It's like a two minute intro. And among movie fans, particularly because AMC has like an unlimited movie plan so a lot of people go to just amc over and over and over again yeah and see it all the time kind of has like this this mini cult following to it and um my favorite bit of it you can i'm sure it's on youtube i knew someone who dressed up as her in that intro for halloween (laughs) got like the the suit and and this woman that i knew um she she's like also a tall woman so it was like very funny very much matched it and um my favorite one is it's something like you'll see things you've never seen before. And then it cuts to her watching Jurassic World. But that's like a terrible example because that's just a spinoff of Jurassic Park. Of course, you've seen dinosaurs before, you know? So Yeah, yeah not a great look in that regard. But they open several episodes of Buzzed On Movies reciting that opener and then it kind of trickled off. Uh, I don't know it by heart. They were hoping that there would be like a Christmas update or something. Some some like sequel intro that she re-recorded, but it hasn't happened. She's been interviewed about it. I feel like I heard they were doing a special one at some point. I like the original. Keep the original. I saw another friend who on Facebook, he bought a Heartbreak Feels Good in a place like this hoodie. <laughs> so they, they all have merch. Oh, man. That's how you know. I guess everything has merged nowadays, so you know. I don't know. So, Brian, how many times seeing it in the theater now? Is this just was this your second time seeing it? Yes, second time on the big screen. I went back in 2012 when they had the first 3D re-release, and the justification for that was it was the centennial of the sinking of the Titanic. So, 1912 to 2012. Yeah, Titanic holds up, Brian. It's a good movie. Controversial, but it's a good movie. Yeah, I really, really like it. It's it's a great film. First time in 3D, and then they also, the digital remastering and IMAX, apparently they added some high frame rate. Brian, we were talking a little off pod about how this could even be possible, because I think it was it shot on a normal 24 per second camera. As far as I know, yeah. So I don't know if they used like tweener software or something to like generate additional frames. I'm not sure. You've mentioned in the past that when you stumble upon a 60 FPS version of something that was initially 24 FPS. And I saw one of those recently on YouTube. I was looking up a scene from the movie Transformers and someone had released a 60 frames per second version. And I, and I like my eyes bugged out. I was like, whoa, what's going on here? Why does it look so weird? Um, I didn't notice it in Titanic, though. When we, like, I, I honestly... Couldn't have even told you that it was anything different from the normal release other than the 3D, of course, which was my first time seeing it 3D. Right. And you've said, like, what is your general experience with 3D? Do you does that bother you a little bit? It does. Yeah, it it can make me a little dizzy. Give me a headache. Yeah, I would say 3D hasn't typically bothered me. But in this release, I could definitely tell that they were messing with the frame rate. Mm. Like at the very beginning when the little submersible was going down through the water, high frame rate to me looks like things are moving just a little bit too fast. It's like if you're walking a dog and they're like pulling on the leash, they're like trying to, you know, move you a little faster than you want to go. Like it's over eager or something. That's how I feel watching HFR. I watched all those uh, hobbits recently and it's a weird look. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what it was about the underwater... Well, I say underwater footage, I guess. Well, now that I think about it, really the only truly underwater stuff is the submersible. And then I guess when they, <laughs> when Leo descends to the depths near the end, but the the submers- submersible stuff, I really noticed the seams from when it cut to what was real footage to what I assume is constructed footage with like the grand piano and the grand foyer and stuff. Yeah. And the creepy doll and right. All the stuff that's in there. Um, but the 3D, I thought overall was pretty good. There were some times where I really got the cutout effect where it's like 
it almost felt like just a paper cutout had been zoomed in a little bit. But a lot of the stuff, especially like towards the disaster stuff, I kind of forgot that it wasn't initially in 3D. I just thought it looked really good. Yeah, I I thought it was cool. Anytime that the ship was like coming towards the screen, the depth looked really good. I like when the sub is going around in the beginning and there's like little bubbles and things floating up. Oh, yeah. And they're like outside the screen and there's like little fish swimming by. Right, right. Yeah, that's good. Another thing... Sometimes when I go to the movies, I find that as much as like the big screen, the big speakers make a big difference to my my level. I mean, I'm I tend to be a very audio oriented person in general, but like really having James Horner's score blasting really made me appreciate the score even more. I, I was kind of mixed on it when we talked about it in the episode of A Night to Remember. But I really think that this like I don't I still don't know if it's like the most complex and rich score overall. Like it uses it really hammers that Celine Dion theme over and over again. It's called Rose if you go into the the streaming soundtrack. But I really think it's like a a genuinely transporting and moving theme. Oh, yeah. I've always really liked the score. It is repetitive. The choice of the MIDI chorus is unusual, but I like it. I listen to it in the background when I'm doing homework and stuff. Were there any things that you noticed this time about the story or other elements of the film's construction that stuck out? (laughs) Yeah, we talked a little bit about this too, Brian. It's really a melodrama, so you kind of have this lot of over-the-top stuff. And in particular, just... Well, one thing is, like, the framing story. So this is where the character played by Bill Paxton, who I just learned passed away i mean i don't know if i already knew that but he's not alive anymore that sounds right i think in the last couple years it's not helped by the fact that there's a bill pullman and a bill paxton and they look pretty similar they got similar parts like 90s action star roles and there was actually one movie that they both starred in together oh boy bill pullman and bill paxton (laughs) but yeah so that framing story like when you get the the older Rose character played by Gloria Stewart, really just over the top. Just like, first of all, the things she does is, are ridiculous. She 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 doesn't tell them she has this diamond, this five hundred million dollar diamond they're searching for. That's what it's valued at. I I saw heard that reference somewhere. I don't remember that from the movie, but I I've seen that referenced a couple places. Do they say that number in the movie, Brian? I don't think so, but we've had a lot of inflation lately, so. <laughs> And she doesn't tell them she has it. She brings it on the ship and doesn't tell them she has it. She spins the whole story, which is like from her perspective. Now we go back in time and we see the whole Titanic thing cuts back to her. What does she do? She's told them this whole story. She walks out. She throws the diamond into the water and then she goes to sleep and dies. Like that's my interpretation of her ascending to the afterlife, going up the grand staircase one more time now that she's kind of over the, the wreckage. Uh, very bold of her to to go and do all those things at once. And then, uh, Brian, you you encouraged me to go listen to, there's this movie podcast called The Rewatchables, and they did not too long ago a a revisiting of that. And they spent a lot of time bagging on Rose and the ways that if you start to pick out specific details, she really comes across as a pretty selfish and horrible person. It's really funny. Things I had never thought of. For reference, I've seen this movie maybe seven or eight times at this point. And yeah, they shone light on some things that hadn't even occurred to me. Like when Jack saves her from the back of the boat early on when they first meet. She waits a while before she tells anybody, oh, he he wasn't raping me. He was saving me. Like, to the point that they've got him, you know, almost in the shackles. They've, like, pulled him off to the side and everybody has had time to assemble. (laughs) When you would think right away, she'd be like, no, he was helping me. Yeah. It takes her a while. The one that I was laughing about is, you know, we learn that she's someone who embraces the moment, embraces family. And one of the ways they represent this is she has a lot of photos. Except... The photos are are all of her young. It's such a bizarre thing. It's like, I actually knew someone in college who was kind of weird and was an older student and was like very motivational poster focused type guy. Not a bad dude at all, but he was very weird. He also had a lot of photos of himself. And so as they were talking about that, I was thinking about that. Just like what kind of person spends their life waking up every day and looking at pictures of them when they were young. 
And then the other one that made me laugh is, okay, so like this whole story is about a guy she knew for two and a half days, which, you know, that's, you know, you kind of are aware of that. It's like a short lived thing, but that's what she's spending all her time talking and thinking about when she's lived for like 84 years, 84 years. Exactly. They even say it during there. And there, we know there was another, a man in there cause she had a family. He doesn't even get referenced. Doesn't even get thought about. A guy on the podcast, they call him Mr. Rose. <laughs> and who's taking all these pictures of just Rose? Mr. Rose! <laughs> and then she doesn't go to the afterlife with that dude. Yeah, no, not even there at all. Her soulmate is Leo DiCaprio, who she slept with once. Yeah, but I mean, I like the Bella drama. And what one thing I really noticed this time is like, you have the disaster and you have the romance. And those things really bring out the themes of each other. Like you feel the disaster more because we've been so intensely connected to this romance. And similarly, the romance is like all that more tragic because of like all of the, the violence that's happening around it. And, you know, there's a difference between good dialogue and good story. I think most great movies have both of those. This one, I'm not sure the dialogue is that great, but as a story, I really think it works. There is a lot of cheesy dialogue. Yeah. And I mean, on the one hand, we talked about a lot of this stuff when we did the deep dive uh, in the dedicated episode, but maybe you can tell that this is a movie that's directed and written by the same person. It's like, you know, you could have had a world where maybe somebody punched up the dialogue a little bit if you had a separate person doing the screenwriting, but it really is like a visionary project. James Cameron really loves the ocean. I'll say that one thing that stuck out to me this time that never had in a previous watch was that, in a way, Jack and Rose are kind of responsible for the ship hitting the iceberg because, you know, they canoodle in that car in the cargo hold and then they come out on the deck and they're making out and the watch guys up in the crow's nest are watching them make out instead of looking out at the water. And then they notice the iceberg and they barely hit it. Yeah. They're like, oh, if they had just done it 30 seconds earlier. God damn it, Rose, you're ruining everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that had never occurred to me before, but it's it was pretty funny. It's pretty good. So, Brian, last time you gave it a seven an exceptionally good. Are you still locked in on that seven or would you bump it up to eight? Man. OK, if you're giving me the opportunity, I'll give it an eight. But it just squeaks in. And I question myself when old Rose at the end says, a woman's heart is a deep ocean of secrets. <laughs> I think the worst line, though, has to be something Picasso. He'll never amount to anything. That's always that kind of humor is the stupidest stuff. <laughs> Doesn't bother me too much. But something I noticed extra this time was uh, Billy Zane's eyeliner. Oh, so does he actually wear eyeliner or is he just one of those guys that has like really fine, dark eyelashes? I feel like he's got to have some kind of eyeliner on. Okay. It just, it looked like he was in like a silent movie or something. Yeah. Like an ancient Egyptian. So that that's Titanic. Both of us had it in our, somewhere in the top 50 of our favorite movies ever. I feel confident about that. I would probably bump it up just a hair. And I take, I take it that you're you're right there as well. Yeah. R yeah, really like it. So I would say go see it while it's still in theaters. There's lots of good supplementary material. The Titanic story in general is gripping. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we're going to pivot to continuing train month and talking about a 1926 film, The General. 